Hey, just uh, it's Richard Mel here. Um, you know, I'm with Facts Working People, the blog, and um, I'm in a good mood, and I want to say a few things. <laughs> I'm happy uh, for a moment. Um, I just got back from Trader Joe's, and uh, you know, I, I uh, some guy, a friend of mine, said the other day we were in the pub together, him and his wife, and he he, he told the bartender, "I'll close out. Uh, Richard's talking too much." <laughs> He was he was being very friendly. He wasn't being mean, but the thing is about talking to other workers is um, we learn things from from other workers and we get a sense of what the mood is. Even wor if workers are not in motion, which they are today, there's a big movement today of the unorganised workers in the United States. Even if they're not in motion, it gives us a, a, a confirmation of class how our class consciousness is there, and. Um, so I happened to say to this guy, and I always talk to workers when I go to the stores, and I said to him, um, I told him about the uh, unionization of the uh, store in, uh, I think it's um, Massachusetts, the first Trader Joe's. And he goes, oh yeah, he said, that's great. And then he, he leans over and he said, they're going to pay us more money on a Sunday. Uh, you know, he says like this. And he says, yeah, I says... I said, because um, they, I always tell them they, they have the team on their team member and all of that. And I remember that developing in the 80s when I was in the Central Labour Council and I brought it up and it was, that's, that, that was starting to change. Uh, this idea that you're not a worker, you're a team member and all, all this crap. And um, I, I made a few comments in line to him. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're, not, we, we're on the same team, but we don't control the ball. It's garbage. If I, if I was on the same team as the boss, I wouldn't need a damn union, would I? You know, and, he, and anyway, by the time we'd finished chatting, he says to me as I go and leave the store, he says, bye, brother, <laughs> you know. So it really made me feel good, you know, just being this confirmation among my own class that it's there and it's strong. You can't eradicate it, you can weaken it, and our history can be driven deep into the consciousness, uh, our, our radical history. But anyway, it made me think of all the times that that's happened to me, and there were a few of them back uh, when times were a little slower. And I, I'll give you a couple of examples. I remember back in 96, I was at the, um, I was leaving, I'd left the um, Labour Party convention, Tony Mazzocchi's uh, Labour Party affair. I'd left that convention in Cleveland with, with a buddy of mine. And um, I remember walking through the airport and uh, more often than not, uh, staffers and lefty bureaucrats and uh, 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 even uh, members of socialist groups really, who, uh, as a friend of mine once said, Gerald, uh, it has a, the, the, this, uh, these groups may, may have workers in them in the sense that they're middle class people that are workers, wage workers, but they have a, they have a, a petty bourgeois culture and he's absolutely right. And um, so I'm walking along through, the, uh, through Cleveland Airport, I think it was, or <clears throat> might have been through Chicago that I came. And um, I went to one of those to get something from, I think it was a newspaper from one of those little things that stands along there and the person standing there. And as I always do, I chatted with the woman there and um, I said, yeah, I said, uh, they won't give you a, a stool, you know, because, uh, because they think you're lazy like them. They, want to th they think we're, 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 we're lazy like them. And uh, I said, uh, you know, a union would be a one way of getting a stool. I just told them I just came from a, a, a Labour Party convention and uh, I had no illusions in Mazzocchi's Labour Party thing. And uh, it was pretty soon the left and other opportunists uh, 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 made sure that, that along with the bureaucracy in it that had moved into it that that became nothing but a pressure group on the Democrats and I had no illusions in that but I mentioned that and she said you get me a stool I'll join your damn union it's not complicated and um, that was one there was another one time I was in uh, a bed bath and beyond and I'm walking looking for something and I walk along and I see this old guy he's an old black dude uh, on his knees stacking something on the bottom and I, I said, hey, bro, uh, can I get, I'm looking for this. And he turned around and it had on his thing, uh, associate. You know, so I immediately steamed into that. I said, oh, you're an associate, are you? That's all I said to him. And he said, they don't pay me fucking associate wages. He knows what he is. And it, it's, it's times, it's little things like that that, that, that keep, that, that are so important for us when we talk to rank and file unionists and when we talk to our own class, when we talk to working class people. Now this doesn't mean I'm not making some fetish out of it, but that class consciousness is there. <clears throat> And the obstacle, I always used to say at work that the, the, um, 
the the our greatest ally in a in a way is the boss because the boss will not give up, and it's it's very important that to to talk to other workers not in the way a lot of lefties talk to them because uh, the, the uh, you've heard me go on about this I have absolutely no the left the myriad of socialist and left organizations while there may be many dedicated people in them actually Sean and I always used to say there's more socialists outside these groups than in them so there's something fundamentally flawed with these organizations just like any organization Christian organization or anything else they're dominated by individuals normally men they're undemocratic uh, cult-like all of them in one way or another including the one I was in and was fortunately expelled from but um, it's just things like that, talking with workers. And, you know, I agitate, you know, if I go in a safe way, you know. Uh, uh, and I always say where people around me can hear, you know, don't use the, the, uh, the um, what do you call it, the, the self-checkout. I don't work here, for one. And secondly, there'll be no jobs. And, of course, every worker agrees. And so the importance of that is it's not that they know that, they, that, that that's not good for them. The problem is there's a conflict and the conflict is not only do you have to fight the boss, it's the trade union leadership that's the problem, that's the obstacle to that. To, 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 they've allowed this to happen. Just, just like I mentioned recently, look at this ridiculous situation in, um, in uh, the, the AFL-CIO's convention in uh, June in uh, Philadelphia when one of the, the top discussion was on the question of organizing and they, they, they kept out Christian Smalls, Layla Dalton and others that I can't mention because uh, I don't know their names um, from that meeting to discuss organizing and why is that? It's because bureaucratic cliques are terrified of uh, um, losing control they're not they're there by through manipulation through subversion through undemocratic methods and you, they lose they're terrified of losing control and these young people that are beginning to stir among organized labor uh, unorganized labor in these workplaces where they've been abused um, uh, they're a big danger and I remember when I first came into contact with a full-time apparatus. I was, I was, uh, it was probably the early 80s, could have been the late 70s. I was, act, I became active. Uh, Kate Dolan had encouraged me to get active in my local. <clears throat> That's a blue collar local, mostly men. The president who was a, a lesbian, a woman and a lesbian. I tell you, <clears throat> my local was some local. And uh, uh, this business agent took me, uh, the, the name is disgusting in itself. She took me out to dinner. She came from the council. Got, I got pretty drunk with her. We paid for my dinner and everything else. It doesn't uh, doesn't uh, take me uh, encourage me to have a few beers. I come from that culture and was raised in a pub, uh, um, but I'm not stupid. And she made some argument. She made some comment about my my folks because I was a little bit had a little. It was a little problematic that I, I couldn't understand why does the bureaucracy not move? Why do my co-workers not move? Uh, uh, and so forth. And it was a, joining a left group that helped me explain that and understanding revolutionary history and the history of the labor movement that helped me explain that to myself. But anyway, then she made one comment attacking my members that some of them own two houses and they can, they, they, some of them are landlords because, yeah, and that's true. We had very good jobs the, among the cream of the crop in the United States. But, but she was condescending, didn't like it at all. And what she was trying to do and what they all trying to do when they meet someone, Labour Notes, Labour Notes is weak on this ground too. And the TDU are, are, are bad on it as well. I went to a TDU uh, a panel about rank and file activists. It was mo mostly opportunists on it. And Ken Paff, I don't know whenever he was at last time active in the labor movement in a rank and file level. And they all use the term rank and file. They like to throw that term around. But I'll tell you, in my 30 years, the two, the genuine rank and file are those you're rooted in in your workplace. They're not paid start. They're not paid. Not the people, if they become active in leaders, leaders in the union, they should do it for nothing. Uh, um, but um, the left, all of those left, I was in the Central Labour Council. There were communists, socialists, other lefty types in there, and they were silent as mouse, mice in there, silent as mice. And they used all sorts of reasons why they couldn't open their mouth. Most of them, they were opportunists. But the other situation with a lot of the left was they keep their radical rhetoric for their little left meetings where they all agree with each other. I remember when the, with the killing of Derald Hall when I took that up he was shot by a cop here named um, K 
I can't forget, I forget his name now, but, but it begins with a C. And he was shot by this cock. I took that case into my local. And I remember uh, um, I got a lot of support for that. I explained it the way I did, do on a class level. And then the, the lefty that uh, brought it to my attention, I saw in the, the newspaper the next day that this guy was a bit of an asshole. He'd slapped somebody on the bar train, the subway. He would stole this, stole that. And so I called her up and I said, why didn't you tell me this? Oh, she said, well, you, what, uh, are you going to support the cops against a black youth? And I said, no, but I'm in, I'm in a union hall. Not everybody agrees like your little left revolutionary left group that you go to after you are silent in the Central Labour Council and you talk about revolution and proletariat and dictatorship. I have to explain why we should support them to a lot of different workers, workers that are good unionists but have different views. And then they're reading this in the paper. So I have to be, I have to, it's different than being in this isolated little left clique of yours, you know? So talking to workers is very important because even when they're not on the move, which they are today, and it will affect the organized trade union movement very much, um, this guy said to me today in, um, in, in the Trader Joe's, he, he whispers, I, I don't know if I just said this, but he whispers, uh, they're going to pay us more money on Sundays. And I said, to keep the union out. He said, oh, yeah, you know. What that does is it gives us, it, it, it co confirms for me, because in the last analysis, you can read Trotsky, Lenin, you can read them all, Gramsci, you can read all of these people. Theory is impo important, but if you don't have in your gut the faith, and not a religious faith, the understanding that the working class will struggle to change society, will overcome all the divide and rule uh, uh, issues uh, uh, like racism and sexism and so forth. When we move into struggle, those are weakened. Consciousness is not a static thing. It changes. It's conditioned by, uh, uh, conditions determine com consciousness, as Marx says. So. That's, I just want to say that today it made, made me very happy talking to this worker because uh, I'm not active in the movement. I'm, not, I'm out there. I've got things that I can't that limit me from being active in the movement. Talk to, talk to workers and talk to them as equals uh, if you're a worker. If you're not a worker but you come from a middle class background, there's some good middle class people that are, uh, place their, their, their skills at the service of the working class. But, but it, talk to workers. It's what keeps us alive in the bad times. All right, well, that's what I wanted to say this morning. I'll see how this looks, and if it looks all right, I'll put it up. And I might want to transcribe it. I want to write about it, but writing so much takes me so much longer. All right, take care. Richard Meller, Facts for Working People. Our URL is weknowwhatsup.blogspot.com. That's the URL of the, the blog, Facts for Working People. All right, take it easy and keep fighting.